So I know we've already prayed, but I'd like to pray specifically for this time together because there might be just a few hard things that I'm gonna say. (laughs) You're like, oh great, I came to church, I don't wanna hear anything hard. All right, let's pray. God, I pray that you would take your word this morning and you would land it in our hearts in the healthy places so that our unhealthy places can grow. I pray that those who might particularly be vulnerable to shame and to guilt would find themselves deeply loved by you and unafraid to explore what you have to say. So I ask that you would use our time together in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Last weekend, George and Tondra Gregory talked about the challenging work of improving our relationships and they use the analogy of a beautiful garden and how if we want to have a beautiful garden that represents strong relationships, strong marriages, that there's some weeding that we have to do to get rid of some bad habits and some unhelpful things that we do that that sabotage our relationships. And I wanna continue that theme this week, but I wanna start with um, just a really quick review of what is God's intention for us as Christ followers? What is it that God is trying to do in and through our lives? Well, the very first thing is that the goal in God's salvation for us, it's not merely to save us and to restore the relationship with him, but to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ, to shape us into the image of Jesus. Romans 8, 29, there on your outline, says, for from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would, and by the way, there's gonna be several verses today that you might kind of go, huh, what does that mean? And don't let that worry you. I hope it spurs you to study the word of God. I hope that that will challenge you to study because I'm not gonna answer all those things. We're moving on. But I just wanna point that out to you that there's gonna be a few of those, but so let's read this through that lens. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would, his goal was that they should become like his son so that his son would be the first with many brothers. Well, so that verse tells us that God's intention is to make us like his son, Jesus. Second Corinthians three seventeen to 18 says, for the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, There is freedom, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. This process is called sanctification. It's, if you've been to Foundations, taken that class. If not, I encourage you to do so. You'll learn in there that after we become Christ followers, believers in Jesus Christ, God then starts this process of making us into the image of Jesus Christ. And he does it more and more and more as time goes by so that we are changed into, as 2 Corinthians says, into his glorious image. And it will take our entire lifetime. It's not a once and done thing. This is a process that takes all of our lifetime. The Bible says that he works in us and we become like him. Well, how do we know that we're becoming like Christ? How do you know that you're being transformed more and more into the image of Christ? Well, the Bible doesn't leave that as a mystery. It tells us very clearly in Galatians 5.22. I want you to read this out loud with me. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control really clear what it means to have God be in control of our personality, to be in charge of what we're like as a person so that we are shaped into the image of Jesus because that verse is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. But there's the verses before that that set up a really strong contrast of what it's like when we are the ones in control of our personality, when we're not growing, when we're not being shaped into the image of Christ. And it's here on the screen, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, rather than having the Holy Spirit be in control, the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, 
dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. I mean, the Bible sets it up so clearly. You wanna know what it's like to over time be transformed into the image of Christ? Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's how you can know that God is working in you and shaping you into the image of Jesus. But if instead your life is reflective of these other things that we just read, then you are not being transformed or you're not cooperating with that transformation. There's a sentence there that I've written on your outline, which to me summarizes everything that I want to say. And if you just walked away with that, you would understand this. And it's this. When I am in control of my personality, I will leave damage in my wake. When God is in control of my personality, I will leave blessing in my wake. If you're not sure then you can kind of take a look behind you. You can look back on your life. You can see, have I left damage in my wake? Damaged people, damaged relationships, damaged connections? Or have I mostly left blessing? That people knowing me, they, they come away better. They come away knowing their love. They knowing they're cared for. I have not damaged people. I have left blessing. Well, all of us want to be those kind of people who leave blessing and not damage, but there's something that gets in the way and slows this process down. And that's really what I wanna focus on today is what is it that keeps us from not being a blessing, but instead being someone who actually can cause damage? A few weeks ago, I was um, with my mom, and my mom has Alzheimer's, late stage Alzheimer's, and it's a very sad illness and disease, and it breaks my heart, and if you have a loved one who's experienced Alzheimer's, you know how painful that really is. But even in the most painful of our life experiences, there are some pretty funny things that happen, and you have to learn how to laugh at the funny things even as you're crying over the sad things. So a few weeks ago, I was visiting my mom in the memory care um, place where she lives, and um, she and several other um, uh, residents were sitting there together, and everyone was just kind of quiet in their own world, and mom and I were just kind of quietly talking to each other, and all of a sudden, Eleanor, one of the residents, came walking around the corner. Now, Eleanor was wearing her shirt, her jacket, her socks, and her shoes, but no pants. And one of the residents kind of looked up and said, Eleanor, and she's like, what? And she said, Eleanor, you don't have on any pants. And Eleanor said, yes, I do. And the other resident said, Eleanor, you don't have on any pants. And Eleanor, a little bit louder, yes, I do. And before you know it, everyone is saying, no, no, Eleanor, you don't have your pants. You guys, this is funny. So they're saying, Eleanor, you don't have your pants. And she is louder and louder and louder, insisting that she has on her pants. And the caregiver got up and went over and very gently said, honey, let, let me help you. Let me take you back to your room and we'll, we'll get you straightened out. And I could hear Eleanor all the way down the hall going, I do too have my pants on. <laughs> she was very unhappy with the evaluation of other people around her. She was very unhappy with their evaluation of her and she thought they were absolutely 100% wrong. But reality is they were right. And sometimes this is exactly so true of my life. How many times am I like Eleanor? People in my life have tried to tell me some things about myself, about the way I relate, the ways that I talk, the ways that I interact, and I have insisted that yes, I do too have pants on, they are wrong, and I will usually say it a little bit louder each time they try to tell me because I figure if I say it more loudly, they will see how clearly they are wrong and I am right. I'm not happy with their evaluation of me. I disagree with their evaluation of me, but in reality, many times those closest to me are right. Why do we do that? Why is there this disconnect? Why do we have a hard time seeing ourselves the way that other people see us? Well, it's called a blind spot. And in our body, we actually have a blind spot. If you've got your phone with you or online, you can go to saddleback.com right now, saddleback.com forward slash blind spot, and we can take a little test together. 
And when you get to saddleback.com forward slash blind spot, you're gonna see this image. You're gonna see an image of, there's gonna be an X in the left-hand corner and then a, a dot, a black dot over here on the right. So if you find this, and if you don't, you can try this at home. I want you to cover your left eye. Everybody knows their left from their right, yeah? Cover your left eye, hold it out here and stare at that X, stare at that cross, bring it in as close as you need to. For me, it's about right here because all of a sudden that circle on the right disappears. It's gone, it's gone. And the reason that that happens is because I'm told, not a science person, but I'm told that in all of our eyes, that's where the optic nerve comes through. And so that part of our eye is missing the cones and the rods that, that can, can um, see light and then give us an image. And because that happens in all of us, we, every one of us have blind spots in our eyes. Well, we don't just have physical blind spots, you and I have emotional blind spots that keep us from seeing clearly and there, it creates a disconnect between the way we see ourselves and the way other people experience us. So the reason that we have this dis disconnect is because we are blind. We are blind. And a blind spot, an emotional blind spot, I would define it this way. The places in our personality where we lack clarity, insight, and awareness of ourselves and of our patterns of reacting and relating in life. We all have them. Nobody is immune to them. It's not like you can ever outgrow them and you'll become so spiritually mature or emotionally mature that you'll never ever have blind spots. We all have them. And if you're not sure that you have them, I would just advise you in this moment to think back through your lifetime, back to high school, back to college, back to early relationships, back to people that you've been close to through your life, and are there some things that the people who get the closest to you say about you over and over and over again? It doesn't matter, you're in one relationship, you break up and you get in another relationship, and what do you know? That person says the same thing about you as the person in the relationship you were just in. There are some things that people have said to you about yourself throughout your life, and you've had a hard time believing them to be true, and that is because, as Paul David Tripp says, we can become blind to our own blindness. We become blind to our own blindness. And even when we have flashes of insight, we have these moments in which maybe you're in a, a conversation with somebody or a conflict and this little light glimmers in your head and they're telling you something. And, and for a moment you have this insight of, wow, okay, maybe, maybe that's true about me. But if you don't take that seriously and act on it and do something about it, that little flash of insight goes away. And over time, those little flashes of insight stop coming and you become rigid and locked into those places where you are stuck. C.S. Lewis in his um, series, The Chronicles of Narnia, the last book is called The Last Battle. And in the last battle, the king has won, there's peace in the land, it's, there's beauty, and the, there's good things getting ready to happen for the people again. But in the middle of this beautiful field, because peace has been restored, there's a group of dwarves. And all through the, the stories, the, the dwarves have been pretty negative, pretty down on everything. And in this particular scene, they are sitting huddled in the middle of a beautiful field, but they're huddled together and they're just muttering to each other. And then another group of characters walk up and the dwarves say to each other, do you hear voices? I hear somebody, but I don't see anything. The other characters are like, hello, hello, here we are, don't you see us? And the dwarves are saying to each other, I hear something, but I don't see anything. Do you see anything? I don't see anything. And the other characters are going, we're, hello, we're right here, we're right here next to you. And they say, well, maybe if you can't see us, here, let me show you this flower. Here, maybe you can smell this flower. And so one of the characters hands to the dwarves some beautiful flowers, and the dwarves hit it away like, whoa, why would you put that stinky smell? Don't, can't you see we're in a stable, and why are you handing us stinky stuff from the stable? And the characters are like, 
There's no stable. You're sitting in the, middle, in the middle of a beautiful field. Here, maybe if I touch you and I can bring you into, and you can know that I'm touching you. And as they touch the dwarf, the dwarf hits at them and says, why are you hitting me? And the other characters say, I- I'm not hitting you. I just touched you. And they, these characters are becoming so frustrated because the dwarves can't see. They think they're in a dark, dank stable. And then the character Aslan, who represents God, comes and they, these characters say to, that, to the character Aslan, please, can't you help them see? Why can't they see? And so Aslan says, well, here, let me spread a beautiful feast in front of them. And so he spreads this beautiful feast full of the best food and the best wine and everything that they could possibly want. And he gives it to the dwarfs and the dwarfs start eating it, but they're complaining, saying, why are you giving me hay? Why are you giving me this stinky water to drink from a stable? And one of the characters, Lucy, is so distressed. And she says, Aslan, why can't they see? And he says, they have chosen not to see. Here's the danger of taking those flashes of insight and not doing anything with them. It's there on your outline. Over time... If we keep choosing not to see, we will no longer be able to see. If we keep choosing not to see, we will no longer be able to see. If we don't let God work in us, shaping us, making us more and more and more like his son Jesus, producing that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control in us, we will become like those dwarves sitting in the middle of beauty, unable to appreciate the goodness and the beauty of life, the goodness and beauty of our relationships, the goodness and beauty of what God has wanted us to see. We will lose our ability to see the truth. Well, why? Why would we do that? If we hear that, why do we continue to choose blindness over sight? Why would anybody do that? Why would we refuse to see the truth about ourselves? Why don't we learn from our mistakes and seek freedom from our own prisons? Why do we persist in being like Eleanor, insisting that we're wearing pants when everybody else can see that we're not? Why do we insist on being like the dwarves, unable to see the good in our lives because we have been blinded by our blind spots? Well, I can think of probably six reasons that I've experienced over my life. And the first is this, pain. Hey, you guys, it hurts. It just flat out hurts sometimes for someone to expose to me or reveal to me a blind spot, something that I very much cannot see about myself. It hurts. It hurts me to realize I'm not as kind as I think I am. It hurts me to realize I'm not as compassionate as I think I am. It hurts me to think I'm not as sensitive as I perceive myself to be. It hurts. So why would we want to experience that pain? Secondly is because of pride. I mean, just flat out, unadulterated pride gets in the way sometimes. You know, through the years here at Saddleback, we've received our fair share of criticism, not so much from Saddleback people, but other folks on the outside. And I do a lot of speaking and public speaking, so we've gotten a lot of criticism But honestly, the way I feel about most of it is like, whatever, whatever, doesn't matter. I don't get too worked up about it. But the people closest to me, the people in my inner circle, my husband, my kids, my family, my friends, my small group, my coworkers, when those people start saying things to me and pointing things out to me that I might not see, I have to be honest and tell you that sometimes I become like a third grader and it's like, Yeah, maybe I am, but what about you? (laughs) Yes, I am, but what about you? And I think if we would be honest, most of us would say that there are some times our ego just gets in the way, and we don't want anybody pointing any stuff out because we're better than that. We don't want to hear it. I think another reason is because of fear. Honestly, there are just some times when people point some things out to us and we get those flashes of insight, we get frightened because we don't know how to be any different. Even if we were to say to somebody, well, 
maybe, maybe there's some truth to what you're saying. Okay, maybe I can see that a little bit. But inside of us, there's the sense of, I don't know how to do it any different. This is the way I've always been. I don't know. What if I try and I'm actually worse? I'm, I'm afraid to venture into that territory. What if I can't be different? Another reason is because of laziness. Goodness gracious. Um, it just takes a lot of work to change. It's hard work to change. It's hard work to grow. It's hard work to be any different than we are. And there are points in our lives where we're just like, you know what? I'm kind of comfortable with my brokenness. I have always been this way. It sucks to be you to have to deal with me, but you're just gonna have to deal with it because it's just the way I am. You know, you get me, this is what you get. And that's laziness. And then there's stubbornness. There have been times I've just been in rebellion. No, I'm not going to. No, just no. And God shows us something or other people point things out. And there are moments in which I have just said, nope, not going to do it. And then there's one that we don't always think about a lot, but I have come to appreciate it even more and more, its impact on our blind spots. And it's trauma. Those painful, <clears throat> pardon me, those things that have wounded us and scarred us in our past, in our childhood in particular, those things that were abusive, that were violent, those things that we witnessed, those things that were done to us, those things that we saw done, those things that people said that were cruel, that were meant to harm us, they were meant to belittle us, they were meant to tear us down. And those things over time can create a distorted view within ourselves of ourselves. And we can no longer see clearly, not so much because we don't want to, but because as we were younger, we developed some ways to cope with that pain, to cope with that trauma. And it served us well in our childhood or young adulthood because it got us through. But as you grow, as you mature, as you become a person, a whole person that's trying to be shaped into the image of God, those things will no longer serve you to get you where you wanna go. And trauma can be one of those things that distorts the way that we look at ourselves and create blind spots. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. This next part is actually, this is the easy part for me, what I've already said. The hard part is what I'm about to say to you for me. And actually, as I've already done it twice and gonna do it here today, I'm still shaking on the inside because it's a level of honesty that is uncomfortable, but <clears throat> I have felt that this is what I'm supposed to share with you. I have a very strong personality. I'm an introvert. I have a little bit of social anxiety, to be honest, but my core personality, I have a very strong personality. In fact, what has been told to me my entire life is, man, you're intense. <laughs> I have heard that from the time I was a little girl. I heard it through elementary school. I heard it through high school. I heard it through college. I've heard it all of my 44 years of marriage. I have heard it from family. I've heard it from friends. I've heard it from coworkers. I've heard it from strangers. I have heard over and over and over, man, you're intense. So I think I'm intense. Um, <clears throat> but there's a more troubling phrase to me that I've also heard several times in my life, many times in my life. I like Kay. I do. I just don't want to be on the wrong side of her. I, that hurts. But in the last month or so, um, five statements have been made to me by people who know me really, really well. And every one of these statements, I don't want you to feel defensive for me when I tell them to you because I want you to know they were truly said by people who love me, who have my best interest at heart. They were said gently. They were not said as weapons to hurt me. They were just people who love me enough to tell me the truth about myself. Um, the first was from Rick. <clears throat> He's the only person who I will name um, <laughs> to protect the guilty. <laughs> Uh, no, you don't need to know who the other people were, but Rick's okay with me sharing this with you. And Rick and I have, like George and Tondra talked about some of what of that intense fellowship, some of those conversations they talked about last week. And 
you know, the reality is some people don't like to know that Rick and I are imperfect people. They want, you guys want to put us on a pedestal and think we never mess up and we never sin and we never argue and we never dislike each other and we never say mean things to each other or we never act like third graders, um, you know, that, and the, sorry, just hang around me for five minutes and I can get rid of that notion for you really fast. Um, but he and I had had some intense fellowship about a month ago and um, we were then at the point of, you know, both of us had kind of, calm down, we were working through the resolution part of it, and this is what he said to me. <clears throat> Sorry. He said, Kay, you can't see what I see. You don't realize the impact of your actions. You don't realize how ingrained your behavior is, how automatic, how pervasive, and sometimes how destructive. Someone else said to me, do you realize how passive aggressive you can get in conflict? Somebody else said, I just don't think you're aware of how intense you really are. Because to you, you think we're just having a conversation, but to me, I feel like you're angry and hostile and upset with me. Somebody else said, talking about uh, a mutual acquaintance, you know, he's a little bit afraid of you. And I shocked myself by saying, good, I want him to be a little bit afraid of me. <laughs> And it, I was so shocked that that was my instant response, but I realized, no, I wanted this other person to be afraid of me because it gave me a sense of power. It gave me the sense that I, he will meet my expectations if he's a little bit afraid of me. And then somebody else I love said to me, I am trying really hard, but I don't know how to please you. Like I said, that's why I'm a little bit shaky as I get to this part of the message. But you guys, since January 8th of this year, when I did my New Year's resolutions, yes, I missed January 1st, but I got to it by the 8th. And on January 8th of this year, I began praying this prayer every day, and I'm going to pray it every day of this 2019. It was this, God, please reveal to me my blind spot. Please reveal to me my blind spots. I don't want to be in control of my personality, leaving damage in the wake. I want to have you in control of my personality so that I leave blessing in my wake. And I've decided that was a really stupid and dangerous prayer to pray because God has been doing exactly that. It's been this cascade of blind spots being revealed to me. And I'm a little bit like, you know, in the Jack Nicholson movie, A Few Good Men, where he's like, you can't handle the truth. And I'm like, yeah, right, I can't handle the truth. <laughs> so here are the two passages of scripture that I am praying for myself this year as I pray for God to reveal my blind spots. The first is Psalm 19, 12 to 14. And this is my prayer. God, how can I know the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me. Cleanse me from these hidden faults and keep your servant from deliberate sins. So it's like, I know there's stuff I can't see and is hidden, so show that to me and then help me deal with the things that I know about that I'm doing. Don't let them control me and then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth, the external things you're gonna see and hear, and the meditation of my heart, the things you will never know I'm thinking and feeling and believing. May these, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And then Matthew 7, one to five, this is Jesus talking. And he says, don't criticize, and you won't be criticized, for others will treat you as you treat them. And why worry about a speck in the eye of a brother when you, Kay Warren, have a board in your own? Should you say, friend, let me help you get that speck out of your eye, when you can't even see 
because of the board in your own. Hypocrite. First, get rid of the board, and then you can help your brother. Then you can see to help your brother. And the visual I get when I read Matthew 7 is that of I'm walking along and I don't realize that I have got a two by four stuck in my eye. And so I don't realize that every time I turn my head, I'm whacking somebody with that two by four. And if I turn my head this way, I'm whacking people on this side with the two by four. I don't even know that I've got this board protruding from my eye and it's hurting people, it's hitting people, it's doing damage and I don't even know it. And yet I'm fully engaged with helping the checker at Target with the speck in her eye or the speck in my husband's eye or in my children's eye or in my coworker's eye or, or you know, the customer service rep that I'm dealing with from the insurance company or you know, a few politicians that drive me batty. I am fully engaged with the speck in other people's eye not realizing that I've got a two by four in my own. Well, there are three responses. We've kind of hit on them that I think are typical to, to blind spots. First is just to reject it. It's not true. Keep insisting you're wearing pants, my friend. You can go through life insisting that you're wearing pants if you want to. Everybody else around you, no, you're not. But you can keep insisting you're wearing pants if you want to. You can reject the, that what you hear about blind spots. Secondly, you can acknowledge it. You can say, you know what? That, that just might be true about me. And you can say, so I'm going to stop doing X, Y, Z. Whatever it is that somebody says, I'm going to stop doing that. And you can try in your own effort. You, you can see the bad fruit, the bad stuff that you're producing. And you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop. And that's better than rejecting it. But there's a third alternative. And it's the third alternative that I'm pushing for. It's this. It's to acknowledge it and let God root it out. Let God root it out. Other people can see the bad fruit that you're producing. They can see the stuff that's coming from your life that is not healthy, that's not helpful, that may even, in fact, be damaging. They can see it because it's pretty obvious. But what they can't see is the root. They can't see why you're doing what you're doing. And I don't want to just be content with trying to pluck off bad fruit. I don't want to keep producing it. I want God to get in and do his work and root out why it is what I'm doing so that I stop producing that fruit. I want to be like Galatians 5, 22. And that's the part of how in sanctification, that's God's part. He, he shows me where I'm wrong. He reveals it to me. I see it. And then I bring it back to him and say, God, do your work inside of me, please, so that I don't keep producing this fruit. And that's how growth happens. So how can we learn to actually and accurately see ourselves? How do we actually learn how to see ourselves accurately? Well, four things. First of all, I, you have got to start from this place. You have got to know and believe and accept that you are God's beloved. You've got to start from that place that you are God's beloved that he adores you, that you are precious in his sight, that you, I mean, you bring a smile to his face, even in your brokenness, even in your marred state, even in your wounds, even in your immaturity, even in everything about you that's not right. God does not love you any more or any less, whether you get this all right or not. His love for you is not gonna budge. It's stable, it's sure, it is dependable. The sun's coming up tomorrow morning and God's love for you will be fresh and new every day and starting from the place of knowing that you are his beloved and that he longs for you to walk in freedom from your blind spots. He longs for you to stop being blind to your own blindness. He loves you. Romans 8.1 says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus, 
No condemnation, even as God is talking to you. He's not doing it through a condemning voice. I don't know if you noticed when I was reading that part in Matthew and I was saying where Jesus is speaking and, and he says toward the very end, he says to the people he's talking to, hypocrite. And lots of times when people are reading that, they read it like this, hypocrite! As though Jesus shouted hypocrite to those that he was talking to. I think he was talking to his followers and because they were his dearly loved followers, I think he said it through a much more gentle tone of voice like, hypocrite, don't you see? Don't you see what you're doing? God's voice to us is not that of thunderous hypocrite. He comes to us through his love and we are his beloved. Second thing is to look at an accurate mirror. It's so important to look at ourselves through an accurate mirror because of the distorted mirror that many of us got, the distorted views that we were given of ourselves. And when we look at an accurate mirror, it helps deal with our defensiveness and it helps deal with the trauma of what we might have been, might have experienced. And the most accurate mirror for us to look at is God's word. James 1, to 25, I wrote part of it on your outline, but I want you to see the full part here on the screen. The, and it's talking about the word of God. It says, and remember, it's a message to obey, not just to listen to. Don't just get those flashes of insight and walk away. He said, don't fool yourself, for if you just listen and don't obey, He's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, but as soon as he walks away, he can't see himself anymore or remember what he looks like. Here's the part to, to understand. But if anyone keeps looking steadily, looking steadily into God's law, God's mirror for free people, he will not only remember it, but he will do what it says and God will greatly bless him in everything that he does. God's word is always an accurate mirror for us. It will not tell us something that is not true about us. You can trust what God shows you about yourself in his word. He will show you first that you are his beloved and second that his word and his, his evaluation is right. Uh, Revelation three seventeen to 18. This is Jesus talking to some of the churches in the last times and he says to them, you say, I'm rich with everything I want. I don't need a thing. You don't realize that spiritually you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You don't have pants on. My advice to you is to buy pure gold from me, Jesus says. Gold purified by fire because only then will you be rich and to purchase from me white garments, clean and pure, so that you won't be naked and ashamed, and to get medicine from me to heal your eyes and to give you back your sight. God's correction to us never comes through that voice, as I said, of disdain, that voice of guilt, that voice of judgment. It comes to us through that voice of love. He is the only one voice that will tell us accurately the truth every time about ourselves. And to know that I can look in his word and I can know that I'm his beloved and that when he speaks to me, speaks correction to me, tells me, Kay, you know, sometimes you think you've got it all together, but my sweet one, you do not. You are actually poor and naked and blind and weak and miserable, but that's okay, come to me because I will transform you. Then that deals with that fear that I have and that you probably have at some point in your life. If people really knew me, they would run. If people really knew me, they would not love me. But when we know that the creator who created us, died for us, is working to make us into his image every single day, loves us, says there's no condemnation for you, and the words that I speak to you are correction in love, not to make you small and feel ashamed and feel less than, but to actually set you free and help you see. The third thing 
Once you've done this internal daily work with God, I'm your beloved God. So anything you say to me is going to be because you love me. And then go to his word for the accurate picture that reworks the the mirror that you've been looking through all these years. Then externally, move this now to the external and start examining your relationships for patterns of behavior. Start looking for patterns of behavior. Look at your typical interactions with the people closest to you and see if there are repeated places of conflict, places of misunderstanding, places of where you are accused of not relating well, of not responding well to life and to people and to circumstances. There is that old adage that if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it is what? Probably a duck. And that applies here. If you have heard some of these messages over and over and over and over again, and your response is, no, it's not true, you probably need to pay some attention. And here's one of the things that I have been noticing about this. Why is that so important? Why can't we just work this stuff out with God? Why can't we let God, me and God in my Bible and my quiet time, me and God in my prayer time, why can't me and God just work this out and then I'm changed and I'm transformed and all you see is the good stuff. And you just see, oh my, you have really changed. Why do I have to, why can't I just work it out with God? Because God is interested in our relationships and our willingness to to do the hard work with each other. See, if God shows me something about myself, he's perfect. So he's the perfect talking to me, the imperfect. I can, it's hard, but I can deal with that. If you tell me something about myself, now it's the imperfect talking to the imperfect, and that is not as easy for me to do. That is not easy for me to do at all because the thing is, God will give me grace. I know that. God will say, I know how hard you've tried. I know where you've been wounded. I know the scars. I know the broken place. I know everything about you. And so I'm gonna give you so much grace. I'm gonna give you so much credit for where you've tried. You, on the other hand, not being able to see inside of me are not gonna give me that same credit. You're not gonna see where I've tried. You're not gonna see the times I zipped my lip instead of saying that great zinger that I had ready to say, you're not going to give me credit for the places where I've been broken, where I've been wounded, where where I've been traumatized. You don't see it. But this is where we restore relationships. Working first with God and then carrying it out into our external relationships. So ask yourself regularly. There's five questions there for you to ask yourself on a regular basis. First, what is it I'm pretending not to know? That one kills me every time. What is it that I am pretending not to know. Second, what is it that I'm pretending is not a problem? What is it that I keep saying, that's not a problem? That's not a problem. I don't know what you're so worked up about. That's not a problem. What is it I'm pretending isn't a problem? What is it that I'm pretending I've overcome? That I've grown past, that that was in the, oh yeah, I used to be like that, but I'm not like that anymore. I've grown past that. That's over. That's done with. What is it that you're pretending that you've overcome? What is it that you think you're good at, but those closest to me or closest to you tell you, no, you're not so good at that. And I don't mean your skills. I mean, sometimes people will say, you know, you think you're a really good listener, but you are not a good listener. If anybody has told you that several times, more than once, please pay attention because you are not as good a listener as you think you are. Or the places where somebody, you think that you are so compassionate or you're so grace-filled or, or you're so kind or you're so optimistic or whatever and the people around you are telling you something different. What is it that you think you're good at but the people closest to you You're not so good. And then this one, what's it like on the other side of me? Ask yourself that question. What's it like to be on the receiving end of this? What's it like to be on the receiving end of me? That question right there will start a revolution in your soul. (laughs) And then the fourth thing is to establish a daily practice 
of humility before God, a daily practice of humility before God so that you come to God and you deliberately and intentionally say to him, God, please reveal to me my blind spots. I recognize that I am blind to my own blindness and I need your help to be able to see. And I come in a posture of humility that says, I I think sometimes I've got this mastered. I think I'm good at this relationship stuff. I think I'm doing things well, but God, I recognize that there's things I probably cannot see. So in a posture of humility, I ask you to show me. And you start then with a place of confession. So for me, this year, I have been reading Psalm 51 in my time with God. Because in my time with God, Here's the confession that I pray. And I'd like for you to just maybe close your eyes and and just listen to this. This is David after he has messed up so badly. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the heart. So you can teach me to be wise in my inmost being. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You've broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. You would not be pleased with sacrifices, or I would bring them. If I brought you a burnt offering, you would not accept it. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart, O God, you will not despise. Father, we stand in your presence so grateful to be your beloved, to know that any correction that you send our way is not to shame us, It's not to harm us. It's not to make us feel small or weak or less than. But your desire is to show us how to see truthfully about ourselves. The places where we are weak and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So that we can be healed. So that we can grow. I pray for my brothers and sisters, especially those, Lord, who may have heard this through that broken mirror of trauma, of things that have been said and done to them that have made it very difficult for them to hear truthfully that there might be some things that need to change. God, I thank you that your mirror, your word is accurate about us and true and just and loving and gracious. And I pray for anyone who maybe is just even recognized in this time that they don't have that personal relationship with you and so they're not confident that you're actually working on them, helping them to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So may they, in this quiet moment, in the quiet of their hearts, just say simply, Jesus, I want to be your friend. Would you be my savior? I confess to you that I have sinned and I have fallen short of who you wanted me, who you created me to be. Please be my savior. I give myself to you. So Father, take all that we've said. I pray that we would become people not in control of our own personalities because when we are in control of our own selves, we leave damage in our wake. But our heart's desire is to leave blessing in the relationships and the people and the places that we touch every day. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I want to invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking class 101. 
Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.